Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Art, and I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I'm here today to represent the work of the NASA High Mountain Asia team, or HIMAT. HIMAT is a group of almost 100 scientists over 14 different research institutions. It's a group that was formed about a year ago under NASA funding to examine the changes of the High Asia region. So we're talking about all the glaciers and snowpacks at high elevations that span the entire Himalayan, Himalayan range, all the way from the Tian Shan and the Karakoram in the Western Himalayas, down through India and China to Nepal and Bhutan in the East. And this is a highly collaborative effort. We're bringing together scientists who are experts in many different fields, in climatology and remote sensing, in model development and analysis of field observations. And our goal is to pull all this information together to really inform what we know about glaciers in the region, where that water is going, and how it may impact some of the people who are living in this area. Because we know there are literally millions of people who care about what's happening to the water in the High Asia region. We think about our science objectives, we can kind of break it down into three main components. And it's going from kind of the high elevation mountains down to the coastal plains and where all this water ends up at lower elevations. And then thinking about, well, once that water gets there and the partitioning of the water between the various components, how might it impact people who live near these water resources and really care about the timing and intensity of the different changes that we're going to see now and into the future as this area responds to climate change. So we have a really strong focus on understanding the cryosphere, what's happening to all this snow and ice that's forming up at high elevations. These are some of the highest mountains on the planet and they intercept all the storms that come in and we have enormous amounts of precipitation that lead to the formation of around 41,000 square kilometers of ice. This is the largest concentration of ice outside of the polar ice sheets. And so we are starting to learn more about this area. We know very little right now. It's very hard to get to these areas logistically on the ground. And this is where NASA really comes in. We have some new remote sensing data to do things like tracking the velocity of the glacier surface. Where does that water go? It ends up at lower elevations. And we have new methods using some satellite observations to really track where the water is at different times of year using gravimetry and other um, means. And then again, we have teams that are really concerned about downstream impacts, outburst floods, landslides, these kinds of things. Now, before we understand the hydrology and the cryosphere, we need to start with the climate because the climate really drives the entire system. So we have teams that we're working with at NOAA, and this is the output from a global 50 kilometer resolution global climate model. And we need to know all the information about precipitation and temperature if we're going to say anything intelligent about the hydrology of this area. We wanted to start with this graphic. It's a really interesting plot that shows three different factors here. The first is the variation in the snowpack that's being modeled by the GCM. You can see the changes in snow over the seasons as it forms at high elevations and then melts away. The second thing we're looking at is the dust concentration. So the model is calculating based on where the winds are going and based on what it knows about the surface, the distribution of these dusts and aerosols here in yellow and brown. You can see the Teklamakan Desert here, huge amounts of dust being picked up and moved towards the west. And then finally, the third thing is the concentrations of black carbon that we see here in these blue and gray tones, of course, related to what we know about the uh, uh, industrial activity in these areas over in China and India. And so we start to get some constraints on the climate and we can use that information to start linking these various systems together. So we're interested in the snowpack next. And here we're looking at a smaller scale study that's really starting to get at the key physical processes of snowpack change. So it's a smaller region and it's our team that's looking at the evolution of the snowpack in these three different panels. We're looking at the top in just the area change of the snow over a span of a melt season. So it drops an area and comes back up as the new snowfall occurs. In the middle panel, we're looking at the grain size, which of course occurs uh, where we have a higher uh, grain size in the melt season as these grains start to bond together and then drops back down again. And here we're looking at the reduction in the surface reflectance or albedo uh, as again, the evolution of the snowpack occurs. So we're starting now, our next step is to take that information about the dust and the aerosols and how that might control some of these physical parameters of the snowpack 
connect those two data sets together and refine our understanding of how the snowpack evolves over time. When snow forms at high elevations, of course, over many years, we're going to form glaciers. As I said, this region has a high concentration of glacier ice. We have a team that's working on gathering together optical remote sensing imagery. This is sub-meter resolution optical imagery from uh, commercial satellites that we have through partnerships with uh, NGA and, and uh, NASA. And when you take these images, build elevation maps from them using stereo photogrammetry, and then put those on top of each other and track the features going through time, you can build these velocity maps that are very useful for understanding how the glaciers are evolving through time. We also simply subtract those elevation maps to get the change in volume. We can start to get a much better picture of how these glaciers have been changing, compare them to older maps from uh, 20 or 30 years ago from other sensors, and really build a long-term picture of glacier change. Now, I showed you a climate model earlier on that was about a 50 kilometer resolution model. If we want to start to say things about specific watersheds and inform our understanding of the water resources in the region, we need to model the system at a higher resolution than that. So this is uh, an output from the land information system model at a one kilometer resolution. So we're bringing together our knowledge of the overall climate, the snowpack and the glaciers, and this is a simulation that talks, that shows us the uh, variations in the water balance. What we want to know at the end of the day is how much water is coming into the system through rainfall and snowfall, and then how much is leaving the system, which I'll show you in the next slide. So the two main inputs are rainfall. And this is a monthly map of rainfall over the span of many different years. And the main pattern you see here, so this is the Himalayan arc, is the big pulse of water that occurs, of course, with the Indian monsoon. Uh, in the eastern Himalayas, you know, in June and August. And here's the snowfall where we have the big uh, drop of uh, deposition of precipitation at high elevations more in the springtime. So we can use that to calculate the, the influx of water. As far as the amount of water leaving the system, there are two main factors there. One is the evapotranspiration. That's the amount of water that's evaporating from the surface or through the, uh, the vegetation in the region. And the second, of course, is simply the melting of the snow at high elevations. And we see that the, precipita or the evapotranspiration kind of mirrors what was going on with the monsoon rains because, of course, we have all this water being deposited every year uh, at those elevations. And then with the snow melt, we see a really interesting transition of the low elevations starting to melt early in the spring and then up to the higher elevations. We add all that together, we can construct our knowledge of the overall water balance of the area. Now we have another team, um, the University of New Hampshire, is running a similar model. We want to highlight a different feature here, and that is, it's a, it's a similar calculation of the amount of melt that's being generated by these glaciers. This is the upper Indus Basin at high elevations. And then this model, uh, we're really highlighting where's the routing of that water as it goes down into the Indus Basin and out to the ocean. And we're looking here at the sort of partitioning of that water. How much of that water that's sourced from the glaciers gets into the rivers, what percentage, what proportion is also going into groundwater. So groundwater is a really vital piece about, uh, uh, in understanding this overall picture. And it really relates as well to the human activity in this area. There's a lot of irrigation occurring. We're learning more and more that this is a key factor in understanding the, the water balance of this area because of all the industrial acti or the agriculture activity that's drawing water out of the ground, we need to factor that into these kinds of assessments. Very difficult to do. We have very limited well data and things like that. But you'll see in a moment how we can start to use remote sensing to get at that as well. OK. So I've shown you a lot of different ways that we can assess the system, but how do we know that this is right? We're running a lot of models. We don't really know if, these, if what we're getting is correct or not. Here's one way that we can do that. We are looking at um, data from what I think is one of the coolest NASA satellites. It's the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. These are actually two satellites, and the measurement is the intersatellite range that tells us something about the orbital parameters of these satellites, and that can be used to infer changes in gravity at the Earth's surface. 
we're looking at that here expressed as a deviation from the normal over the span of the grace record. Blues being where we have wetter than normal conditions and of course reds being drought conditions. And so you can see the overall uh, trends over this entire period of the grace record over the Himalayan region. This is something that we can use in a sort of regional sense to constrain those water balance estimates that I showed you earlier because of course when you're putting all this snow onto the earth that will change the mass uh, and, the, and the gravity signal and you'll see that melting away in the summertime as a loss of gravity. So this is a really great way for us to do large scale constraints and we're also trying to gather together all available field observations. Now we're looking at taking all that knowledge and hopefully informing our assessments of what can happen in the region when we have variations in water over time. And what we're looking at here is the number of landslides that occur across this region from a landslide database. Every time you see a pink blip, there's been a landslide that occurred uh, during this historical record. And the size of the circle tells us the number of fatalities that occurred. Of course, we have many people living near uh, these landslide-prone areas. And when we, uh, one of the ways that we can understand landslides is by modeling that through knowledge of precipitation and the stability of the slopes. So as we improve our understanding and our modeling of precipitation inputs, our hope is that we can use that to better inform these models, provide some kind of risk analysis and, uh, and assessment that people in the region can start to use, and our hope is to start minimizing the size of these circles and the frequency of deaths that occur here. This is just one example of the many ways that we hope this data will inform the region. Others include looking at outburst floods from glaciers, the occurrence of flooding, and um, things like hydropower and the amount of water available for all the different water resources. And so with that, I would just like to wrap up and again um, emphasize really the collaborative nature of this work and the number of different logos you see here is sort of a testament to that. I want to really thank all of the many people who've worked very hard to show you the graphics that I showed you today. Um, and this is just the beginning of the project. We have another couple of years to go. Um, we just published, our, our goal with this effort is to make sure that we are really sharing the results because they're so important for people in the region. Um, and if you visit um, our website here, and also uh, that's where you'll find some information on how to get to the NSIDC. We just released one of our first data products, which is those elevation maps that I showed you earlier. And we encourage our colleagues in the community to start using those. And here's other information. We have a, a GitHub site. Another part of our effort is to really be transparent about the work that we're doing and allow us to collaborate more effectively through the sharing of our data sets and our scripts. So with that, I'll wrap things up and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.